Hello everyone. Thank you for joining myself, Sophie Parrott, a journalist at HR Grapevine, today for an HR Grapevine and WorkBuzz webinar titled The Biggest Employee Experience Trends of 2021. Today's web webinar is definitely a timely topic given that employee experience continues to be a top agenda item for HR. And for this session, I'm delighted to be joined by Stephen Frost, the CEO and founder of WorkBuzz, and also Mel Foster, Head of uh, Customer Success and Operations at WorkBuzz. So welcome to both of you. For our audience of today, uh, just a little bit of housekeeping. Um, in the toolbar at the side of your screen, there is a question function. So feel free to submit any questions that you do have for our speakers today, and we'll try and get through as many of them at the end of the webinar as possible. We'll also be launching a couple of polls throughout the duration of the webinar, so please feel free to get involved with those, and we'll be launching the first one very soon, so keep an eye out for that one. Without any further ado, though, I would like to hand over directly to Mel to discuss the topic further. Thanks, Sophie. First of all, what I'll do is just a quick introduction. So as Sophie shared, my name's Mel. I'm head of customer success here at WorkBuzz. My role is ultimately to make sure that our clients are delighted with the services and, and the systems that we provide and make sure that they get the best out of WorkBuzz. I've been at the forefront of employee experience for most of my working life. I've grew up in internal communications, employee engagement, and seeing how employee experience really does drive change and supports high-performing businesses and teams. What one asked from me linked to Sophie's piece of housekeeping is we're an engagement business. Um, we've got polls launching throughout this session and we've got research that we want to bring to life, but it will only get better if we have a two way interaction with you. So please do engage with us, fill out the polls and do ask us questions. I am here with my CEO, Steve. So Steve, quick introduction. Thank you, Mel. Um, and thank you, everyone, for joining us at home. I've been really looking forward to today. Um, I've been in employee engagement experience about a decade now um, and um, first started a employee engagement consultancy. And out of the back of that, we launched WorkBuzz about three and a half years ago, so in 2018. And it's been a bit of a roller coaster since. Um, and um, so, so the Mel and I crossed paths about four or five years ago, and they're looking back. And I think at the moment, one of the reasons why it's such an exciting time to be in HR or employee experience is because HR is firmly in the box seat. Um, I think over the last couple of years, there's been so much change. I'm going to talk about that on today's webinar. And for the first time, even the most experienced HR directors don't have a playbook, don't have a playbook because we've got brand new challenges, um, not just about should we embrace hybrid work? And I think mean, that horse is already bolted. How do we make it work? How, how, what's the potential impact on our culture? Keep people connected. So things we're going to talk about today. And then secondly, I think you, you can't miss um, the great resonation. I think every time there's um, something in your inbox and content, really, really topical. Um, Mel and I were talking to a client yesterday and just in one division, lost to the 30 people in the space for a week. Um, so really, really by to heart for some organisations. At the moment, I think there's some sticky plasters organizations are applying in um, Red and Amazon in terms of creating a £3,000 sign on bonus for warehouse operatives in Exeter. But that's a sticky plaster, not all organizations can afford to pay those. And if you look at the trends, look at the um, political landscape, the shortages we have aren't going away anytime soon. And the only way organizations can win that's the war for talent. Um, become a magnet for um, the time to join and then to retain their staff was going forward is really focusing on the employee experience. So I, I think if you, if, um, if you work in HR at the moment, I know a lot of, a lot of you will do on today's calling, it's such an important time. HR firmly in the spotlight and around that board table be lots of conversations around plans for 2022. And people are key more than ever before. I think CEOs realise talent isn't just on demand you need to focus really on building your employer brand focus on employee experience so such an exciting time so thank you all for joining us and we look forward to sharing with you some of the research that we have to share um, in terms of just a couple of minutes about WorkBuzz to begin with so mention WorkBuzz was spun out of an employee engagement consultancy I founded um, about a decade ago um, but as a brand is about three and a half years old um, and our vision on Offstar is to help improve the working lives of a million people. And we're, we're lucky to have um, about 400 clients now. And our smallest clients 
it's six employees in Queensland, Australia, our largest sort of 50, 60,000s and everything in between. Um, and we like to think if we can help that client with six people or some of the largest clients with 50, 60,000 measurably improve their employee experiences, measure through work buzz. That's how we can sort of um, contribute towards um, realizing the vision. That's our North Star, that's a compass. Um, what we really believe is every organization is different. Um, I think too often um, in, in certainly HR tech, we can be very prescriptive. There's a one best way of listening to your people or one best way about performance management or one best way about something else. But if you're going to work for us where everyone is digitally connected, able to work remotely, what's right for your organization in terms of listening is going to be quite different compared to if you're in a factory or if your employees are driving trucks, whatever it may be, very different challenges. So what we're really passionate about is every organization is different and it's trying to work out the best way to listen to your people and um, do that in a really modern and agile way. Um, when I founded the business, we've been a bootstrap business to start with, um, for, 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 um, founded for spare bedroom. We were originally providing our clients with Excel-based reports. We took our first round of venture capital funding earlier on this year. We've more than doubled the size of our team. And what that's allowed us to do is really innovate, to use things like AI and machine learning to group tens of thousands of comments for our clients into some um, insight topics, overlay sentiment in there too to give their CEOs a snapshot of really what the people are saying um, from free sets comments to. And what we're really proud of are some of the brands we work with and how we help them um, really for a strong partnership ethos. Um, whenever we talk into an organization about employee experience, it's trying to really find your why, what will the business metrics will look into improve and are really, really fortunate and proud of the brands we work with and the difference we've made over the last few years. We also regularly bring together our workbus community. So um, we were really keen to do a face-to-face -face event this year. And I remember talking through to some of our team and says, we really want to do an event in London, but are we going to be crazy? I have so much uncertainty. It's going to be another lockdown in the autumn. People are going to be safe to travel. So we, uh, um, we started to go ahead. We, we held an event at the National Gallery in London. We had about 70 to 80 of our clients there. Some really, really good um, speakers to um, existing clients, um, like Neil Haywood from Hages too through some part of the organizations we work with and we're looking to run our next work buzz of um, live events in the spring so if any of you are interested um feel free to reach um get in search for hello workbuzz.com and we'd love to um, include you in some of our future events so hey let's give you a bit of context about who we are work but more importantly why we do what we do now i just want to hand over to mel to talk about some context around some something, something we've been we've been calling internally about the potential of the next industrial revolution. Thanks, Steve. Um, I think what's really great about working at WorkBuzz and, and working with a CEO like Steve is, is that we never rest on our laurels and we're always looking out in the market. Um, if we look at the state of the world, I think we'd be silly not to see that things are changing and changing rapidly. The global pandemic has driven changes around the ways that we work, but also how we live. Um, and that's something that we have to face into as people that work in HR, as practitioners, as leaders of businesses. Because when we look at employees, their priorities have shifted. Our employees want more time for themselves. It's their time. They're, they're focusing on it more. They're valuing it more. And what we're seeing is that the top talent are seeking an employee value proposition that has a good deal for them, um, rather than just clinging on to what they had in the past. And, and I say the past. This was even pertinent last year as we were going through the pandemic. People were just happy to have jobs. That has, see has seemingly changed quite quickly. Um, and what we're seeing is that they're more happy to prioritize their needs now and look for the right role for them. Um, but as Steve mentioned, this is all new. So it's all a bit scary. And, and if you've done greenfield roles before, brilliant. Um, but if not, then you it's, it's a bit of a loss as to how do we tackle it? So what we're big in believing is coming up with solutions together. Um, and I think when we look at um, your, your data points and pieces like that, we, we are keen to listen to employees. In terms of this impact of this industrial revolution, revolution, what we're seeing is a huge increase in the great resignation. So you're all probably seeing this. Um, and I think there's a, a piece just around data. And if you just looked at Google searches around resignation letters, you see this 111% increase in just that search for a letter. 
Um, so it's happening all around us. And what we're seeing are that the younger generations are driving this. It's predominantly driven by millennials. Um, a survey by Employment Hero has found that people in, in terms of the millennials are the most fed up. And about 77% of them have said that they're looking to change roles within the next year. They're very closely followed up by their Gen Z peers, um, where 74% are looking to change what they're doing within the next 12 months. So it demonstrates that that attitude of a job for life absolutely does not exist within those generations and they're driving this change to find something better. Steve's mentioned it, we speak to clients on a daily basis who are coming up against this challenge, but we're also seeing it in our own life. Um, I'll be lucky to say that I'm, I'm just about in the millennial stage, um, but I have friends that are leaving their jobs and, and I've got two friends that work in financial services in, in the city. They're both leaving their 100k plus jobs because they can, because it's burning them out, because they can make that decision now and they can see that the grass actually can be greener for them somewhere else in a completely different field and they can take their talent elsewhere. So it's about looking at what was your talent pool and almost understanding that this talent pool has become a talent C. People can go where they like now. I completely agree, Mel. I think we even saw um, last summer some of our key stakeholders, the HR directors, people directors, start to reevaluate what's important for them. And actually, uh, they don't want to put up with commuting to central London every day and having their evenings and not seeing my family as much and just reevaluating what's important. So that's definitely shifted. Um, I think as well, if we look a bit further forward, I think, um, there's, I think there's almost sort of three phases to this pandemic, or there could be three phases for, for, from a talent perspective. The first phase has really been about how well the organisations looks after their people. With all that challenge last year, did you furlough people and message it in the right way? If you could afford to, did you top up the furlough to 100%? Did you communicate with your employees? If you were struggling, did your CEO take a pay cut as well to share you all together? Um, so I think we said last year, if you look after your people now and bring them with you, you're going to bounce, bounce back faster. I think we've got the second stage now where it is absolutely a candidate driven market, not just in traditional sectors like engineering and technology, but lorry drivers and warehouse operators before we haven't had those shortages. I think there's a, a third stage that sort of um, a lot of people aren't talking about yet is really around we've, we've shifted to hybrid work in lots of organizations and we'll talk about that. But how would you make that work effectively? We've seen a few clients, we've had a few clients we've seen actually start to ray back from being fully remote, feeling the culture has been too diluted and, and change that we'll talk about. And then beyond that, I really think there could be a brand new industrial resolution over the next decade. If you think about what happened sort of um, a generation ago with lots of manufacturing jobs getting offshore um, to places like the Czech Republic, um, and Poland, for example, all of a sudden now, if you're a CA looking to hire talent, you go to where the talent is rather than just, just the UK. Um, why would you pay 50 grand for a graphic designer in London who's good if you can get someone who's amazing for slightly less money than that anywhere in the world? So I think really, really, there's some profound changes now, but I really think it's just started. Yeah. There's a huge amount of changes going forward. And rather than competing just for talent against local employers, I think we're competing much more on a global basis for talent. Um, so huge amounts of change. Absolutely. Thanks, Steve. I think that really brings it to life and, and demonstrates that, that need. Um, what's really useful as well is that we've conducted a piece of research and it was conducted in August of this year. But we had over 300 responses from HR professionals. And this piece of research called the State of Employee Engagement covers data points that bring to life HR's biggest challenges, the effect of hybrid working, an enga employee engagement divide, which we'll talk to you a little bit more and, and demonstrate how that's coming to life, and therefore how to improve your employee listening. Um, what's really important is we did run this in August. Time is moving quickly. Things are changing even faster. I can't believe it's December next week. I'd better start Christmas shopping if you haven't already. Um, but if what I really want to know and, and what we want to use these polls for um, is to understand what are your biggest challenges right now because whilst we ran that in August we're conscious that we're in we're almost December now so let's see how that shifted. Thank you um, and thanks everyone for voting so far. Um, we've definitely seen some interesting results here so I'm just going to um, kind of 
you know, read those out and then see whether it kind of marries up with your expectations of what you're expecting. Um, so the the top, the one that seems to be coming out on top is engagement with 62%. Um, then I'm just having a look because obviously it's live, so it's, it's to toggling slightly. <laughs> but um, we've got retention and hybrid working round about 40%. Obviously, as I said, that keeps moving as more people are voting. Um, and well-being with 14% currently seems to be at the lower end of the scale so just to recap really engagement is coming out on top with retention hybrid working also um at the top and well-being is the other end of the scale would you guys say that this is something that you're expecting or you know what are your insights really from the data that we've just seen here i think it's the same we'll, we'll come on to a second um or we can, we can share the results from, from the research we did back in august I think the key thing to really emphasise, a lot of those things are really interrelated. Um, we talk a lot of, um, it's, it's interesting engagement come out top. I think you said 62%, which isn't surprising. Um, but I think if, if you think about um, engagement, you can't necessarily drive engagement. That employees choose to be engaged or choose not to be engaged. But instead, you can focus on creating that right environment and that um, level of employee experience that ensure employees do choose to become engaged. So I think... Um, things like well-being, absolutely, if you support your employees, you have their back, um, you make sure they don't burn out, you support them, um, that contributes towards engagements. Um, and then there's obviously a link between engagements and solving um, or improving employee retention in the long run too. So I think they're, they're, they are definitely interrelated. Do you want to talk through medicine so this slide and the key headlines from our research? Yeah, yeah. And I think what's interesting is, is the top reason on your on the poll here today and, and on the poll here in terms of data is that engagement and improving EX. What I would say, though, is, is we're probably a bit of a biased audience because we are here about listening about EX and state of engagement was about employee engagement. So I would hope almost that that is one of your top priorities um, because that's <laughs> probably why you're here. Um, in terms of things like retention and hybrid working, you can see that we had them around the 40% already in August. So it's good to see that that's continuing. And I think that's pretty common. Um, I think what I'm speaking to most clients about at the moment is absolutely retention, hybrid working, because as we're trying to implement our new hybrid policies, it's maybe not as simple as, as we initially thought it would be. And it wasn't as simple as a government mandated you must work from home order, um, which gave us almost a, a very clear direction, um, whereas now we are very much in, in a grey area about how we do that. Um, the thing that I'm quite surprised about is how much well-being has dropped compared to where we found it in August. So you can see it was at 56% when we talked about it in August. But I also think that that might be a sign of the times, as in our focus isn't as much about protecting people and getting them to return to work as it was in August anymore. We're more in a steady period where we're just finalising our new normal. We're more comfortable with where we are. We've had a brilliant vaccination process in the UK. So There's no homeschooling. No, yeah. It's back at school. <laughs> Everyone's Those feeling a lot there. better about that. Um, but as Steve said, all of these things are really important because they impact that overall employee experience and your ultimate goal to retain employees. Um, I think well-being and hybrid, we know COVID was a catalyst for those elements. Um, I'm a bit surprised, well, not maybe not surprised, but I, I'm very virtuous when it comes to DNI. I'm a big believer in creating diverse and inclusive workspaces um, so I'd like to see that higher especially after what happened last year with the George Floyd's murder Black Lives Matter and, and all the heightened awareness globally um, but it demonstrates that as practitioners we are having to prioritize different things and I think pivot much quicker than ever before um, which is always hard in, in HR teams because it's not like you've got too much to do already um, but there's always conflicting priorities but I think a lot of these loop back around to each other and, and will help each other if you focus on them. And we'll share some research now won't we sort of in a few minutes time that really looks at if, if engagement is more of an outcome if you create a great employee experience create an environment where employees choose to become engaged that's that's how you drive engagement you can't drive it per se. I think things like well-being and, and even we've seen in our research, diversity, inclusion, and more employers expecting that now. Yes. Um, and we'll come on to some really strong correlations between organisations that are really focused on diversity, inclusion, and move the needle on that tend to be move the needle on engagement. So they go hand in hand and we'll, we'll, we'll leave it in a few minutes. Great. Um, in terms of the targets, <clears throat> what we're seeing is that people are being measured on more than anything, turnover. 
so keeping people and, and not losing people um, there's other things like absence engagement diversity metrics um, but more than anything turnover so it's about keeping people and, and how we engage and, and develop them with your organization um, as a business I think we try to practice what we preach and, and obviously we're in the boat with you turnover is one of our focuses and and engagement as, as we do and move through the times so just to kind of bring that to life Steve did you just want to share how we operate that at work Buzz? yeah no, no, I, th- I think there's a, a really important distinction as well now so we can make about um, leading and lagging indicators so I think in a way if, if someone's left it's too late <laughs> it's really hard so they may be around around that's the fewer and fewer chances to turn that around um, so I think the most forward-thinking organizations we work with um, we'll absolutely track turnover. They'll track measures like absence, but we'll look at those lead indicators, look at intent to stay, we'll look at the reasons why people uh, maybe consider leaving for the best talent walks out the door. They'll look at how does that vary throughout the employee life cycle. More and more of our clients are now um, expanding rather than just employee experience for existing employees. What's the candidate experience look like from an employer brand perspective? How are we delivering on, 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 on our sort of brand promises? and um, perceptions for people that may want to join. So I think Lagnik indicator is really, really good, but where we can supplement them with lead indicators, so you've got time to influence before, before they um, result in outcomes. Um, in terms of our journey at work, Buzz, um, we've increased our headcount about just over two times so far this year. We're still recruiting if there's any, any, any software developers that may react to PHP in the call at the moment, any, mar- any superstar marketing people, salespeople, um, customer success members as, as well if, if you if you are looking for all give us a shout we were uh, constantly recruits it um, um what, what was really important for us when we raised our our vc funding is we looked at our biggest challenges going forward and some of them around um really accelerating our product roadmap so we could innovate and bring to our clients features they haven't asked for um, faster and faster Secondly, we create. We were creating a customer advisory board against some of our, our key customers together in the group, really to help us co-create the future together and align work as their biggest strategic challenges. One of the other five top um, things we highlighted was around our culture. As we scale, we don't want to lose the DNA of work us and the things that our clients love about us: the flexibility, the partnership ethos. So we really focused on our culture codes, and we made it clear to existing employees and also to new starters. We describe work as a bit like Marmite. It's really fast paced. It's one of the hardest places you've worked, but also one of the most rewarding. We talk about the next few years of work as being career defined and, and sort of now to grow in a huge and a really, really compressed amount of time. But we're trying to put people off joining the company and um, want to get excited about and um, just because the cultural fit is really important and being a really fast paced organization. And we talk a lot about our values and one of those is about delivering wow, which is about making our own clients heroes in their own organization. So we, we focused more and more I mean, in terms of scaling our own culture and trying to make sure we track great talent that wants to stay by getting that sort of hiring process really well. What we then do is sort of we drink our own lemonades. Um, we use work buzz to track our own cultures. This is um, we did quality pulses. These, this is the results from our last survey. We um, closed start of November. Um, we, we measure engagement through the stay stay drive, but also say proud to work here and so on, and that emotional connection. But crucially, in terms of retention, one of our questions is I would stay working at work as even had a comparable job elsewhere. And then the follow up to that question is why would you stay or why would you leave? And what's really important for us in terms of lead indicators is the reasons why. So if someone says they're looking to stay, the biggest reason six and ten of our team say it's because of our purpose and vision. So that's super important for us as an organization, really trying to uh, make a difference, trying to help improve the working lives of a million people. So for us, as, a, as one of the leaders of our business, this helps us quarter by quarter to really track our culture, track our talent, people risks, and make adjustments. And as we've gone through a huge amount of change in terms of working remotely, um, coming back into the office a couple of days a week, we've created our first overseas team. Our, our, our engineers um, are, are based in Poland. It's brand new change. I always know the answers. But what this allows us is really track our culture and use data to work out where we need to focus more on, what's working, and any emerging risks before they come into issues. Um, so, and we're seeing more and more of that across um, um, across our clients. So, I think we're going to move on to our next poll, which is linked to what we just, just touched on about hybrid working. 
Yeah, thanks, Stephen. Um, we've had some votes come in so far. I'll just give you guys a couple of seconds or so if you if you haven't voted but would like to, um, just so that when I read out the results, it's more accurate and I'm not having to chase chase the the toggling results. But um, currently, as I'm looking at it on my screen, um, the overwhelming response appears to be yes for hybrid working. Um, with the current figures, we're looking at about ninety five percent yes and five percent no. Okay, wow. So nineteen and twenty. Mel, do you want to talk through how that sort of compares to our research? Yeah, sure. So I think for us, what was really interesting is breaking it down a little bit further, as in looking at the markets that you're competing in and, and the other employees that you're competing against. Um, in reality, when it comes to hybrid working, we, we've got to take a view of, of the difference between office based um, organisations and then organisations that have staff that are primarily based on site or site based um, or, or frontline workers physically need to be on, on premise. And what you can see is a huge difference, obviously, as, as you may expect. Um, but what I would recommend is, is almost considering where you are against your peer group. If you're on the left hand side, where most of your staff are office based and you're making no changes, you are absolutely in the minority at this stage. When we're talking about your EVP, when we're thinking about that war on talent, it's highly likely you're going to lose some of that talent if you've done nothing. And I if completely you agree. Yeah, yeah, if you haven't already, it sounds like there's only 5% on this call, but what I would say is, is that 5% use this data to have that conversation internally. Now, I completely appreciate not every business can adopt it. You know, WorkBuzz, I think we've, we've done a great job adopting hybrid. I think driven by Steve, the leadership team, it's been the right balance for us, but we are a SaaS technology business. Consider where you're at, think about what's important for you. Um, but what I would also think about is if you're on the right hand side, it's more common that you're going back to the ways of working pre pandemic and not making the change. That's the majority over there. So 51% saying, no, we're, go we're going back to pre-pandemic. And why I think what we're seeing is there's been a bit of conflict created between frontline and office workers when you have both. But if you're an organization that has primarily on-site employees, um, you've got lots of people potentially that have worked through the pandemic, not being furloughed, having to be on premise when their office colleagues have been able to then work from home. And it's created a culture of them and us, which we want to dissipate. We want to overcome now that we're getting through COVID. Um, so I've seen a lot of my food manufacturing clients, as an example, say, actually, we've gone back to how we were before because that feels more comfortable to make sure that the culture is fair and equitable for everybody. It, it's about doing the right thing for your people. Um, sorry, Steve, you could add in. Yeah, no, I, I think this is my, my one size fits all. It is much more complex, Mel, isn't it? If you've got a mixture, if you've got a factory, and then above the factory, you've got your office staff, it is more difficult. I think the when we held our workers Live event um, last month, we had, I would say, a third of the audience there fit into that group in terms of a mixture of on-site and an office-based staff. And that, for them, one of the biggest challenges, how do you balance it? And I think you've got two things. You've got trying to keep a bit of fairness and consistency with those guys on the shop floor that can't work remotely, as an example. But also, your employees in finance, in marketing, in HR will be looking at other jobs or going to approach from other recruiters on LinkedIn who can offer full flexibility. So it's a really, really, really hard thing to, to manage. And I think other conversations we've had, I haven't met a client yet that's really nailed that. That's got a, okay. that's got a blueprint. I think they're all grappling with how do you, how do you balance those two competing areas? Yeah, and, and even across teams. I think for me, my best piece of advice with, with all of this is to enable honest discussions, transparent, open discussions, because that's how you're going to get the right fit for everybody. Also, don't try to cover up that one team is allowed to work hybrid. Um, people will find out eventually. Um, yeah, it's, it's not wise. Chinese whispers go further. Um, so lean into the conversations and, and be really honest with people about what's truly happening and why, you know, at the end of the day, if we look at different teams, they might have different abilities abilities to flex their work um, and that's okay it's it's yeah. part of the job that we do and the profession that we choose and I think that links to this bit of research Mel doesn't it around sort of um it's a year ago it was an employer driven market a lot of people worried about jobs and just going to pay the mortgage and so the company's not not going under whereas now the we, we've bounced back so quickly um out of this and it's such a candidate driven market and that's not going away I don't think anytime soon absolutely um and I mean, 
what this slide really talks to in terms of Mel was talking about the start of this call in terms of what people values changed over the last 12 months because the COVID forced that sort of reset of prioritization. And when we asked um, the, the, um, 300 plus um, H professionals um, what changed, the biggest things about flex, flexible working, almost nine in 10 said that's one of the most important changes for employees now compared to what it was before. And what this chart doesn't show at the very bottom, we have things like pension, salary, some of the, some, some of these old, old school levers um, um, there that used, used to drive motivation and attract great talent, less important compared to, compared to that flexibility. Yeah. So something goes hand in hand. Yeah. And, and that flexibility, it is harder to do that for site. But I think it, for site, you can rule out the top reason as in work base. It's all <clears throat> about the flex of work patterns, hours, looking at what you can do. It takes a lot of investment. It will take a lot of conversation with people. Um, but you have the ability to make it work. So it is something that I would absolutely recommend investigating. Um, it's all about driving that, that well-being piece as well that, that you can see again, 9 and 10 were saying that that's what people wanted. So yeah, all links through, doesn't it, Steve? <laughs> It does. Good. Um, and I think for us, what we've talked about is hybrid. A lot of you, so 95% said that you are moving to hybrid. Um, this was ran in August, so it would be interesting to talk about this and, and have more of an open discussion. If, if you've got any questions about or, or any suggestions about what your biggest hybrid working challenge is, please do pop it in our Q&A. Um, I'd love to extend this further. Um, but what I think we've seen is that we've all seen the benefits of hybrid working. It's fantastic. And even as a person, individual, I really enjoy it. Um, but but we have to be honest, there are challenges and, and the biggest ones that we've seen are around the connection and alignment to an organization, which goes hand in hand with areas like the collaboration that you can work with other teams when, when your team is spread and nurturing your culture. I think the other element that's there at the top as well on 51% is about supporting well-being needs. It's much harder to see things and people's needs and when they're struggling when you are remote. Yeah. Um, I, I think I've got a lot of clients that are working hard at, at making this happen. So I've, I've got one um, that's called Tax Assist. Everyone probably recognises Tax Assist very, um, you know, you, you can see them on the high street uh, typically, um, but they're accountants. And what they do is, is they have really thought about, whilst they're fully remote, having the right channels in place for communication, demonstrating that they value their people. And when they are returning to office and when they are having more face-to-face -face time, giving them things like a tab in the local cafe so that they can utilize it and that they don't have to reach into their own pockets. Um, I've got a, a client that works in, in software development for insurance called CDL and what they're doing, they're doing things like breakfast mornings with the CEO where they send out lovely packages of, of, for people to come and join a session and, and hear directly. Um, so you're not alone and, and what I think is, is really important is to keep talking to your peers and especially people in, in similar situations as you. Um, and I think one thing that hasn't come out from here that I know a lot of my clients are struggling with is leadership buy-in, frankly. Um, what we saw at the start of this, I think, return to work is, is leadership going, yep, 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 we want hybrid. Um, but in practice, then they've then recalled from it. And then we've had to do things like trials or pilots, et cetera. So how do you use those pilots to get that buy-in from leadership eventually yeah. down the line? And I think that's really important. And I think the challenge has changed with time. So originally, I remember a few clients we have now, literally the biggest challenge was our employees don't have laptops. They have these like <laughs> massive desktops. And I saw us about heads of HR driving down to Curry's PC world and putting their boots, they're clearing out PC world of, of every laptop they could find and sort of things like that. And obviously that's not there anymore. We've had big focus on wellbeing, particularly so certain groups, um, sort of about their own health before they got vaccinated or parents from schools closed. I think the challenge is definitely, definitely evolving. And some really good research from, from Slack um, a, a few months ago looks at the massive benefits of hybrid working but across every demographic group pretty much the one area people said they felt was weaker was that top area feeling less emotion connected to their colleagues and the organization and as you spend more time apart you have to work on it more consciously and people can learn from some organizations that have been fully remote for a long time so um we're, um, we're just setting up an employee share scheme for our all, all work buzzers with our employees, they can become shareholders um, in, um, in work buzz and, and um, try, try to practice what we preach in terms of our values. 
the platform we use and they work fully remote pretty much since they've been founded. But actually today they've got to come to retreat and every quarter for two days, all of their employees come together and that's a chance to sort of keep that emotional connection together. And they have to work harder a bit because they're not in the office one or two days a week. So it's trying to work out how do you still keep that as you spend more time apart, but you have to consciously work a bit. And, and that's led us to make some changes uh, on our platform. So, so we know most organizations do some kind of employee survey. Um, as a big opportunity to think about the questions you're asking, how can you use them to track how effective hybrid work is working for you? So there are some questions on here that we've launched for our clients. Um, really look looking at the risks with hybrid working that sort of not been connected enough to wider organization if i'm working more remotely feeling isolated and um, um maybe, maybe we don't have the flexibility we need if we if we if we move away from hybrid work and around that so if you can weave those kind of questions into your um, it, um in, in, into your service you're asking and there's a second step if you can begin on the left hand side you can see some demographic filters this screenshot from the workplace platform and we've got working patterns. If you could begin to see how does that vary between employees that are fully remote compared to that spending maybe a day a week in the office, begin to map out what is or isn't working with different pockets of your organization. And are our comms working well enough for those employees who are fully remote compared to those in the office? Do we have that sort of two track sort of, um, sort of set in, culture set in? So use your engagement surveys to really track that risk, make adjustments and use it to influence upwards of your stakeholders too. Is what I was saying. That's exactly what we're doing. Um, we work as well with our quarterly pulses that we run. Say, uh, I think Mel's touched upon this, and I'm um, going to hand those to Mel in a second. But one of the biggest surprises the research we have, we knew it would be a challenge, but was just how different the perceptions were um, um, for organisations that were able to work remotely compared to those that were not. Um, and since we've done this research and published the report nearly all the press coverage we've had is about this, what we should call the great employee engagement device. And really, really relevant if you're one of those organizations on today's call that has some employees that can't work remotely because of what they do. Yeah, absolutely. And I think this was around in August, um, but I don't think we've ever seen such a huge divide around engagement. Um, there's been clear winners and losers in the last year or so. And, and we at Workbus are so big on data, like Steve showed you on our platform, we love a filter. Um, so what we like to do is dissect data points like this about why what's going on with engagement, as you can see on the left-hand side, and break it down by the different demographics or filters that we have to hand. And, and for this report, um, one of them was around the employee-based composition. So on the left-hand side, you can see people that are mostly office-based. On the right-hand side, you can see frontline workers on site and in the middle is the mixture. Um, what you can see is that if you have predominantly frontline workers, they are much more likely to have declined in terms of their engagement than the mix of office and frontline workers or just more office based. Um, you've got to think about that and bring that to life put it into context. These people are more likely to have worked through the pandemic not taken any type of furlough, not being able to furlough, feeling a bit burnt out, considering change of role, seeing things in the press about how people are being rewarded and recognised for things. Um, staff shortages. Just, yep, staff shortages. Yeah. We're seeing it all, aren't we, Steve? So it is so important that um, you, you consider that deal for your frontline workers um, because they are more likely to have, have lost their engagement over the last year. Yeah, and that's massive, minus, minus 24%. Whereas if you have a white colour workforce overall, you tend to be improving slightly over the last year because we focused on well-being. Leadership is, I mean, leaders have done a good job on a whole in terms of front net communication, problem for people for a centre stage. But just a massive disconnect. And I read something on social media yesterday, which was the pandemic's been a storm for everyone, but your frontline workers have been in a different boat compared to everyone else. So just be really, really mindful of that if you do have, um, um, if, if your organisation does does have demographics like that. Definitely. We're now going to move to the next poll. So how often do you survey your people? I don't know if you've got some insights, Sophie. 
Yeah, thanks, Steve. Um, just wanted to um, quickly mention as well, if any of you do have any questions for the Q&A session, uh, feel free to put them in the Q&A box, which is located next to the, the, the poll box. Um, but yeah, in terms of the, the results that we're seeing, the question obviously was how often do you survey your people? Um, the most predominant answer was annually at 43%, quarterly 30%, monthly 17%. Um, and weekly and never both came out um, at 4%. So overwhelmingly, it seems that annually seems to be the, the top option there with, with quarterly coming next and then monthly in third. Super helpful, thank you. And um, we'll share the research um, from our side, but also how it's changed over time. So um, as um, um, we, we do our state of engagement survey, Every two years or so, there's there slight delay with COVID um, um, when it first set in. But what we found is, and actually a really, really similar picture actually as a headline. So in our research, 41% were annual. I think on the poll, it's, it's 40%. So hand in hand, but really declined over time the amount of companies getting feedback annually. And I think if, if you could imagine sort of six months into COVID, if you run an annual survey, that meant you wouldn't have any feedback, objective feedback from your employees the six months before we went into lockdown. So all the decisions you make in a, a little bit in the dark. So we've definitely seen that growth. Companies shift into quarterly poll surveys. An example, I think the poll was 31%, we're at 28%. So actually sort of uncanny in terms of, sort of how that sort of fits that profile, very, very similar. Um, in our research, is 5% monthly. <laughs> Any context to add now? Yeah, I think what we're seeing is, is that COVID has absolutely accelerated that pace of listening. Um, I remember sitting with a client um, starting to plan and, and lockdown happened, I think, the day after. Um, it, we knew it was coming and we thought, oh, engagement survey, probably not the right thing to run at the moment. How do we pivot and launch something that focuses on COVID? We did another one with another client. I remember having a very similar experience with them and then they thought, OK, we need to just pivot and focus on well-being and post about that. Um, what I would say is for me it's really important to consider your pace of listening and, and potentially accelerate or listen about the right thing at the right time um, it really does matter to people that you're hearing from them at their times when they're most <coughs> frustrated and things are changing quite rapidly and I think the next slide really kind of demonstrates that really nicely as in we've brought back in the cuts of data you can see the by frequency people um that people are surveying versus if engagement has gone up, down, stayed the same, etc. Um, and what you can see is that you're significantly more likely to improve employee engagement and employee experience if you're listening more regularly. Because what you can see is, is really that as an HR practitioner, I imagine you understand that, you know, the more regular listening enables you to evidence what's going well what's not and tweak things much faster if you're running a huge annual engagement survey sometimes it can be a bit much to to digest um, and that turnaround of, of pace of, of frequency and, and the agility isn't as um, quick maybe as when you see more frequent surveys but again word of warning from me not one, there is not a one-size-fits-all approach it is very important that you take into account the ability of your organization to listen at pace but also to make change and take on feedback um steve and i are, are very aligned on this no two organizations are alike um when we'll never push you to say look you know run run monthly pulses when you've only ran every other every two years because it would just feel so awkward for your people it's about thinking about what's right for your organization and how likely you are to embed that change yeah I think it makes a lot of sense, and I think for, for me, there's a few bits just to add on. I think one, the world's got faster. So um, the idea of just listing once a year, I can't imagine sort of being a finance director and getting your data once a year or a marketing director once a year just because the pace of change and actually the biggest change in how we work and employees. So I generally think even if your workforce and they're all offline, there are really easy ways to survey them with, with, um, with mo um, through, mo through mobile, through text and, and so on. Annual doesn't cut it anymore. I think the key thing to think about is always create a vision. What do you think the best employee list and strategy would look like for your organization and build that to it? So if you wanted to get a stage, you, you're serving them monthly, um, but actually we've done this annually, you can do it in baby steps, maybe shift to quarterly to begin with, build that capability your line managers just act on their feedback, um, link your engagement data to the business KPIs like turnover, like retention, 
to get evidence to your CFO and boards why it matters to get it by and then to drive it. So do so just create a vision, what's the work for your organization and build up to it. Use agile technology to do that. And as Mel's highlighted, common sense. I think some survey platforms, what was included, will automate your questions the rest of the time and rotate them. But it won't take into account if you are going back into the office at a certain point in time, we've got a big change on. Yep. And you're going to peer out to touch. It's really, really important to use platforms like that, but also common sense, relevant questions at relevant times so your employees feel like it is relevant and meaningful for them. Yep. Um, so um, that's what we found there. Yeah, definitely. And I think, Steve, that's absolutely the right thing. <clears throat> and only by listening and, and seeing how well our changes are, are embedded or, or how well they're going down with our employees can we be honest with ourselves about what we need to tweak or what we don't. Um, especially when we're doing everything that's new to us in terms of all these new challenges that we've got. So just a quick summary. Um, first of all, the top priorities that we've seen are around improving engagement or employee experience, retention, diversity and well-being. Um, we've got four and five office-based organisations embracing hybrid working. It sounds like almost even more on this call, 95% of you saying we've embraced it, we're good. Yeah. Um, so that's brilliant. Um, but employees are driving that by demanding that flex in terms of work base or working hours. We've talked about hybrid challenges, um, but what's critical is that we keep employees emotionally invested with the organization, support their well-being, and make sure that we're continuing to nurture the culture that we want for our organization to succeed. Um, fourth one here, employee engagement, we see it as an absolute divide. Um, when you look at that breakdown, especially for frontline versus office-based workers, frontline are struggling much more to stay engaged um, and it is really pertinent that we're open and honest and, and thoughtful and mindful about the experience that they've had over the last year and then the fifth one here is around there's massive change to how we work and live we have to keep listening and talking to people these two-way conversations are invaluable for you to get it right especially when it's new territory um, no one has the answers and there's no one size fits all approach for what we're heading into the challenges that we're going to have around labor shortages and retention and traction are going to be with us for at least the next decade and you've got changing workforces coming in um, so it's important that we keep talking to them and and those remember those generations that are coming in have a heightened expectation of being listened to um, so we need to utilize tools that enable us to do that um, and even if you're not utilizing tools just speaking to people being human in how we approach that uh, I, I, I have some really good points and I think the key thing for me just to add is there's never been a more exciting time I think to be in HR or employee experience and I think mean, you're absolutely in the box seat um, CEO conversations at the moment that's one of the biggest risk to their business plans for the next year is can we recruit enough people can we retain enough people can we physically keep our restaurants open our shops open keep up with demand because because of those time shortages so I think HR are really in the box seat use data to influence upwards um, and drive that agenda um, and doing all, all the great stuff that you're doing. Um, so thank you very much. Um, just, just very quickly for me, just, just a really small plug. Um, if any of you haven't got a really agile um, employee um, um, employee engagement platform or listening to, we still maybe rely on one of those 40% relying on our legacy annual survey, maybe a bit of delay between getting feedback and isn't really been optimized for things like hired and working. If you would like a free trial of WordPress, and we don't normally offer these, but, but feel free to get in touch um, either through that website, um, wordpress.com trial and forward slash trial, or drop me an email, stevens.frost at wordpress.com, um, and we'd be more than happy to set you up. There is a deadline on that um, um, before the 10th of December just to get in touch and register your interest. Um, and that trial extends to using any of our ready made templates covering these are the topics that have come out, say things like hybrid working, employee wellbeing or we can customize all of your questions. It's super flexible and um, would we'll, 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 we'll love to um, have some of you try our platform going forwards. So that's it from me and Melison. I think we may be coming to some questions, Sophie. Yeah, thanks both of you. Um, just to kind of kick off the, the, the question and answer session, um, we had a couple of questions that came in prior to today's webinar. Um, so the first one really, I think is actually really interesting as, you know, we're coming towards the end of the year and we're starting to think about 2022 main focus points and those sorts of things. So what would you say that the main priority for 2022 will be? Stephen, if I can come to you first on that one. So I think it's macro themes. 
um, that will be relevant for a lot of organisations. So I think the talent shortages, whereas retention and attraction becoming almost more important, I think, by the month. And sex as it used to be, and in terms of, say, software engineers, certain roles, like it's almost the whole economy at the moment, whether you are running a cafe in Cardiff or you've got a warehouse in Southampton. I mean, almost every client we're talking to, more and more pressures there. So anything that solves those two challenges, um, and I think EX is, is a key sustainable way of, of, of doing that rather than just throwing money with sign-on bonuses really helps. I think the amount of change we've had will settle down, hopefully, um, in terms of um, we've been through a huge amount of lockdown, schools closed, brand new stuff all over again. I think hybrid work is here to stay. And I think one of the biggest priorities for organisations is going to be how do you make it work culturally? I think we'll see some organisations saying actually our culture is becoming diluted. Um, we're not keeping our employees connected enough. They're not able to lap enough of those sort of corridor or coffee machine type conversations. So how do we really get the benefits from hybrid work and from, from a corporate business perspective along to the flexibility and that that become more and more apparent next year? And to add now. Yeah, yeah. I think outside of what you've just covered, there are two topics that I'm talking to clients quite um, frequently about at the moment. Um, and I think it's really driven by these younger generations and, and them having more of a voice and, and driving change. Um, one is EDIB, so quality, diversity, inclusion and belonging. So or DNI, as, as some of you might might say. Um, that's really important that we focus on, we think about that pipeline for future talent and that they really care. It's, it's a non-negotiable for them, they need it in. But also if you think um, about headlines and, and what people are focusing on in that younger generation, um, whether we call it CSR or ESG, um, and it's all changing now, but having the right focus on our impact on the environment um, and how we are measuring that in organisations, I think is, is really important to be thinking ahead to. I suppose um, the, a bit of a mixed bag there, but they all do come back to the the core focus point of, you know, cultivating a good employee experience. Um, another question that we received in um, before the webinar was around um, the surveys piece. Um, and the person said, we're doing annual surveys currently. Where should we start with modernizing approach, uh, our approach to this? Um, Mel, if I can come to you on that one first. Yeah, sure. So, um I think it's really important, I'm, I'm a big believer in current data, to look at where you've started from and then build a vision about where you want to go to and why. So is it that you want to eventually get your managers completely owning their action plans from an engagement survey so that they, one, they become stronger managers and people leaders, but two, so that they actually act within their local remits. Um, and by defining where you are, that starting point, you can then reverse engineer how you get there. So we use something that we call a cultural maturity model, looking at things like leadership buy-in, management capability, almost ticking the rungs off that lever so that you can go on that long-term journey um, but what I would say is it's not about just thinking frequency first it's about thinking about how mature your organization is and, and where you are there yeah and don't go from annual to weekly <laughs> or, or, <laughs> no. and, 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 and less and less and less and special reasons as, as a manager a, a demand and it employees demand and it and um, I think the other, other bits add is a different angle different lens I think um, what we had on the slide a few minutes ago was really around company-wide surveys and on, on a continuum. We are finding more and more of our clients and, and certainly from our roadmap, product roadmap, that's of massive investments in this, is around the employee life cycle. Um, and if you think about some of the big drivers um, regarding retention, we know lots of our clients, some of you on the call may agree, actually you tend to have a spike of turnover in the first six months. And then things settle down and you may get a few more bumps, but the first three six months are so important. So think about deploying an onboarding survey to work out, are you really nailing their first few weeks or first few months joining the housing pad of expectations? You've got recruitment rights, our managers doing what they should be doing in terms of one-to-ones, inductions, inductions as well. Also about the candidate experience perspective. I'm talking to more and more clients about that. Um, you haven't, there's not a bottomless pit of candidates now, which is a really, really good thing. Um, I didn't like when, um, when certain organisations would just treat this production live employees that can work for them so we can treat you rubbish. I think those days are gone. Um, so think about the employee life cycle as well, rather than just the company wide surveys. One of the things that you obviously mentioned in there was potentially not going from annual to weekly 
basically kind of overnight and I suppose that might be one of the the key things to bear in mind and potentially avoid are there any other top things that should be avoided when you know striving to to modernize that approach <clears throat> Stephen if I come to you first so just to reinforce something else is about what your organization is ready for so um you want engagement not just be owned by HR it's by HR owned by everyone in the organization including your senior leaders through to your managers so what's their readiness likes act on feedback what upskillings they need if they need a bit more maybe shift towards course level. I think that was the second most common um from, from, from your and um, from the poll and also we see from our clients gives you 90 days between at between feedback we use that frequency at work versus and for our own service it works well um so I think that readiness bit's really important what managers are ready for how much time do you need as a leadership team to digest the feedback acts and follow through and also about server fatigue. Um, we've got no agenda on work, but you can do weekly surveys and they're automated for the next six months. You can do annual. Um, but actually, we, we have found some clients that shift too frequently, particularly sort of, um, weekly, bi weekly, in some cases monthly. We find response rates begin to decline as too much noise for employees, not the time to manage the acts and feedback. And not strategic enough, you, you rely wholly on sort of out the box questions that are work really well written, whatever platform you use, but you want to be able to personalize a bit for your organization and what change you're going through, what's on the agenda at that point in time. Just to add, from my perspective, in terms of things to avoid when it comes to anything EX, and I'm going to quote my old maths teacher, he said, <laughs> never assume it makes an ass out of you and me, which is, if I had a whiteboard, I'd write it on so you can see, but obviously, I appreciate you can you can think that one through. Um, yeah, yeah, still, I don't think we could read it if you wrote it, though. So, um, but I think what's really, really important life advice, and especially when it comes to employee experience, no two organizations are the same, but no two individuals are the same either. And what's really important for, in, my, in my perspective and, and also throughout my career is never assume because you can listen, you can ask people just as easily. And by canvassing that opinion, engaging with them, it instantly will give you a better idea about where to head than you had already in your head. So do ask questions and, and don't feel like you have to come up with all the solutions by yourself. I think all of those kind of tips of things to avoid were, you know, really good food for thought for anyone that might be thinking uh, similarly to, to modernise their approach. Um, just wanted to say a massive thank you to all of you for listening. And of course, a special thanks to uh, Stephen and Mel at WorkBuzz for um, chatting with us today and sharing those insights. Um, if you do have any questions, feel free to get in touch with WorkBuzz directly. Um, also, just to flag as well, there is a downloadable resource underneath your screen. So feel free to go and check that out. Out. Um, and I just wanted to wish you all a fantastic rest of the day and we look forward to welcoming you back to additional webinars in future. Thanks everyone. <laughs>